Well, to borrow a phrase from a man I uh, deeply uh, admire, uh, I'd like to pull up a chair. Oh, yes. And it might be a rocking chair, two octogenarians here. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll have to get somebody to start. I always remember uh, a general, Joe Stilwell, in World War II, and he at the fall of Corregidor, he was put into the prison of war camp, and he stayed there for several years. And finally, he came home, and someone said, General, uh, what are you going to do? And he said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is sit in my rocking chair. And then <laughs> after about six months, I'll rock. <laughs> so maybe I'm looking for that. Well, what will you do after you walk away? You know, I have no idea, and I haven't given it the slightest thought. And one reason being, you know, when people retire, let's say they're 65. I hate that word, by the way. Well, or yeah, retire. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> but uh, if someone decides that's enough at 65, uh, he has probably another 20 years. So you say, what are you going to do with those 20 years? When you retire at 89 and someone says, what are you going to do? You say, live. You know, <laughs> that's really it. Survive. So I'm not sure. But I have a big family, and I certainly plan to spend the time with them. Let's go all the way back the first time that you probably didn't hold a microphone but sat at least behind a microphone. What do you remember about that very first time you were communicating with an audience? I guess it was professionally anyway uh, with the Brooklyn Dodgers. I had Red Barber on one side of me, Connie Desmond on the other. The very first exhibition game was in Vero Beach and it's dated. It was with the Philadelphia Athletics. And I remember I went into the little clubhouse to get the starting lineup. And Jimmy Dykes, who was the manager, was in a chair getting a shave. And standing alongside of him, talking to him, was Connie Mack. Goodness. Connie Mack out of the history books and dressed exactly the way you, you would expect. The dark suit, the straw hat, the cellular, it was amazing. So that's the first time, and by the way, I was scared to death. And early in that game, the A's pulled off a triple play. No way. Yeah, <laughs> and luckily, Red Barber did the triple play, and he did it so effortlessly, so calm and accurately, and I sat there thinking, I'll never be able to do that. <laughs> so that was the first day I can think of. Um, I was going to ask because people ask me all the time, and it's interesting. They don't want to know about uh, the moments you thought you were maybe almost there and had that really good call. They want to know about the embarrassing moments in your life. I can't imagine you ever making a mistake. Uh, yes, very early in my young career, the Dodgers were playing a night game against the Cincinnati Reds, and this is not rehearsed, so this is something that really is stuck in my heart. And uh, an outfielder for the Reds came up, and his name was Lloyd Merriman. And Lloyd Merriman hit a line drive foul outside of third. My mind told me to say, there is a hot shot hit foul outside of third and it didn't come close to that everybody in the booth fell down i was absolutely terrified frightened upset embarrassed uh, and no one said a word after the game and then about a week later i went into toot shorts which was a right. famous old restaurant and one of the head waiters came over and said i don't know if we should allow you in here and i looked at him and i said why and he said, because you used the word on the air. And I, he was the first one to bring it up and toss it at my feet. You know, I think we do have one thing in common about our background. And, and I'm, I think, so blessed because of that, that we grew up in black and white radio. There mm -hmm. wasn't television. And so we were able to use our memory and imagine our great heroes and what was happening and how it was uh, being described. Don't you feel that made you a better announcer? Probably. Uh, again, another story. Uh, in a spring training game, Red Barber was broadcasting the game. And as he was broadcasting, um, we saw a lot of weather. And I remember the way he described the weather. And then that year, at the end of the season, was a huge game, Dodgers and the Boston Braves. And it was one of those games, it was the bottom of the fifth inning, Dodgers were winning by a run, and there was a huge storm coming to the ballpark. And uh, Oh, Sam Jethro might have been the hitter. And Red is describing that storm and at home listening. I kept almost looking out the window. And the storm was going to come. And the question is, when the storm hit, there'd be no more game. 
and the Dodgers needed one out to make it an official yeah. five-inning game. And oh, did he broadcast an absolute gem. I mean, I felt that rain. I could smell it. And sure enough, Jethro made an out on the first pitch, and here comes the storm, and the game is over. And I thought, that's one of the greatest broadcasts I've ever heard in my life. And about a couple of years later, <laughs> I'm now doing a spring training game, and it's a nothing game. But I look off back of right field, and I see a storm coming. And my mind said, hey, why don't you rehearse? Try and do what Red did with the weather. Right. And so I am now in this meaningless game describing this great storm which is slowly but surely approaching and I you know red had the raindrops on the shortstop the bill of his cap the rain was coming out and I'm saying it's now coming all of a sudden it hits me it's not rain it's smoke and I'm stuck now. Somehow I've got to swing the weather around. A wind blew the storm out. So, yeah, I, I've had some bad moments, believe me. Well, in my privileged career, there has been nothing more delicious in any sport than calling a no-hit, no-run game. And I've only had nine. You've had, what, 23? Something. Is it about? Is there anything better than calling a no-hitter? No, and the best one is on radio. Uh, the biggest reason, and I learned that, with Koufax, for instance, he'd be pitching a no-hitter, and I would describe him wiping his brow, drying his hand off, on it, lifting his cap and running his hand through his hair. All of the little minutia that mean so much mm -hmm. to bring that picture. On television, it's all there. And I remember that really drove the point home, doing the Kershaw no-hitter here. There wasn't anything to say. I mean, I couldn't say he's now mopping his brow because you're looking at him. Right. And when he finally got the last out, the only thing I could say was, he's done it. There was nothing else. So the radio was far more enchanting. And doing the one Koufax of the four, I decided I've always put the name and the time. Yeah, that was brilliant. Well, not really. I just thought, you know, whoever it was, the first one that I saw was Vern Bickford back in 1950 <laughs> with the Boston Braves. That's a long yeah, time ago. I remember. And I remember saying, you know, I'll, I'll put the date on this so that 25 years from now, you know, he'll have it to tell his grandkids. And I always put the date on and give the pitcher the no hitter. So I've done that with Sandy three times. Now Sandy's pitching another no hitter, and I'm thinking, well, now what can I do to make, I put the date, oh, well, I'll put the time on. Now, you know better than anyone, time means nothing in a ball game. But I put the time on. And when the game ended, that's all people talked about. The time no, of day, not the time of the game. Right, the time of day. It's 9.46, as Sandy Cook. And I never thought of it as being drama or theatrical. Everybody thought, that's the most brilliant thing you've ever... <laughs> Really? I didn't know. It was pure accident that we put the time on. Are they going to, uh, we could stay here. I could stay here. You've got to go to work, and so do I. But uh, before we go, yeah. um, I, how can I phrase this? What are you going to miss most about uh, this opportunity, or what have you enjoyed most about being a broadcaster? I, I, I love people, really, whether they're players, whether they're people who run the elevator, the guys I work with here in the booth, I absolutely adore. So I'm going to miss people, not just players, not just the game, people and the roar of the crowd. Those are the things that I will, and I know I'll miss it. I mean, for sure, you're going to yeah. miss what you've done all these years, but it's like missing that I wish I was 16 again. You know, that's <laughs> not going to happen. So I will just take people and the roar of the crowd and the love of the game. That'll be enough to fill my belly for the rest of my life. Well, we're going to miss Vin Scully, and uh, on behalf of the fans throughout uh, the nation and the world, uh, you've helped us all to love this beautiful game all the more. And for a broadcaster, the inspiration you've given all of us, uh, how can we thank you enough? Well, bless your heart. God's been so generous. I don't know why, but he has been, will be, I pray, in the future. And I love you and all my other pals in this crazy business and and bless you for all your good thoughts and congratulations on a magnificent career yeah, i didn't you. cry at cooperstown i, mean, gee, I didn't yeah, cry you did very well <laughs> i was waiting to see no crying at cooperstown <laughs>